Okay, well, we'll make a start, everybody. So it's my pleasure to say hello and welcome back to the Australian College of Physical Education and the Monday Night Coaches Club, this time on a Sunday. So uh, I refuse to change the name um, until I get, get used to it. Um, my name is Gareth Long, and we are delighted that you could join us on our 17th webinar. Um, so as I always say, uh, please use that chat function to introduce yourself, get some questions down for our panellists and each other, and of course, answer those questions as well. So probably realised a few things are a little bit different today. Um, firstly, it's obviously a Sunday, which is different for us. It's also the first panel where our guests are from the same club. So they know each other. They probably saw each other yesterday or something. Uh, so that's another first. And also, uh, in the absence of Chris, Drew and Warren, it's the first webinar where we have former panellists as co-hosts. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce, introduce them to you now. So firstly, I'm going to introduce Kat Smith. Kat appeared as a guest on webinar eight way back in June. Kat is the former assistant coach um, in the W League for Melbourne Victory and is a performance analyst for the Junior Matildas. But tonight, Kat's going to be monitoring the chat function and selecting some great questions to ask our panel later. Thanks for stepping in today, Kat. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Uh, you got a, a late call, but uh, our next... Um, Panelists got an even later call, woke up about an hour ago and saw a message um, from me. So uh, our second co-host is uh, Jan Van Loon. Jan appeared a few months ago in webinar 15, previously the head of individual player development at Arsenal and head of opposition anal anal analysis at Wolfsburg. Jan is currently the head of coaching at FC Utrecht. Uh, and today Jan is going to be listening intently and summarising the key messages for me. Jan, thank you very much. You had time to walk the dog. You had time to comb your hair. Thanks for joining us, mate. Looking forward. A brilliant topic uh, today. So um, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Like, like Jan said, I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion. I think it's, uh, we'll get a fascinating insight into what's probably quite a unique context. So for anyone that doesn't know, um, our guests tonight work at MacArthur FC. MacArthur FC are the latest A-League club who will make their debut in the 2021 season. And as a new club, I thought it would be quite interesting to find out their plans around developing a playing style, playing philosophy, almost from scratch or from the outside, seemingly from scratch, but we'll, we'll find out. So I'm going to introduce our two panellists. First, I'm going to introduce um, Ivan Jolich. Ivan is the assistant coach for MacArthur FC, having fulfilled similar roles for the Matildas. Central Coast Mariners and Melbourne City, not Melbourne Victory, as I terribly put in uh, the message that went out. Uh, Ivan is an A-licensed coach and an experienced coach educator here in, in Australia. Ivan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Gareth, and a uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. And it also gives me great pleasure to introduce Kate Cohen. Kate is the head of analysis at MacArthur FC. And prior to this role, Kate was analyst for the Matildas, the national women's team, as well as a coach in the Sydney FC Academy. Kate, likewise, thank you for joining us tonight. Not a problem. Good to be here and good to be on the same call as Ivan on our uh, one day a week where we're not supposed to be together. We've ended up being together again. <laughs> so you two know each other's Zoom etiquette very well. well that's good. That should, that should make this run smoothly. Um, OK, well, Ivan, I'm going to kick off with a question um, for you. And it's, it's really around this topic of um, a playing style, playing philosophy. And I'll probably use those terms interchangeably unless you tell me to, to use one of them. So um, I'd like to know whether MacArthur already have a, a clearly defined playing style and ideally which bits of it can you tell us about? I think the first thing is that we as a football club probably don't have one as a football club that's driven by the football club, but both Kate, Kate and I have worked with the, the head coach, Ante Milicic, um, for a few years now, and, uh, and he definitely has one. And it's probably one of the reasons why when he's assembling his staff, he wants to bring people into his uh, technical team who, who do understand his, his uh, you know, philosophy on football and playing style and that ability and the biggest challenge of bringing that to life with the new group in particular. So, so yes, we do have one, and that's probably more the, driven by the head coach as opposed to 
uh, as opposed to the club. We're, we're a club in its infancy, as you know. So hopefully we're we're building on a on a, a playing style that maybe might be there for many years to come. That maybe the legacy will leave. But for now, it's driven by uh, Bryante and and the challenge of bringing that to life in in, uh, in a pre season with you know twenty odd new players is uh, is a great challenge and and lots of fun to be a part of. Okay, so you know I'm not going to ignore that second part of the question. What, when we when we see MacArthur uh, play, what what will the sort of playing style look like? Do you, do you anticipate? Well, it'll be clearly defined. You, you, you'll you'll watch MacArthur and you'll you know from the basic spectator to the to people like your like the audience who are probably a lot more technically and tactically proficient. It'll be clear, and that's one that's one that's possession based. We we always feel as though we want to dominate the ball and uh, and and enjoy the ball. Um, and then when we don't have the ball, we will do everything we can to win it and regain it as quickly as possible. So it's a very dynamic and di- uh, demanding um, philosophy or playing style. Um, and like I said, it's it's something that uh, players generally, um, my experience has been with this playing style and philosophy that players really want to buy in because it's always about us and it's always about us having the ball. And that's what players psychologically want. They don't want to go into games thinking, oh, we'll give them the ball or we'll allow, allow them to have the ball. So we never, ever will want to make our our um, our game game day or training week experience about the opposition. Yes, we respect the opposition, but it's all about making sure that we're dominating the ball um, and, and trying to win a game of football that way. Okay, thanks. And th- th- this this next little question that I've got for you is probably is possibly too early, but I'm sort of asking you to see in the future. Um, do you think all MacArthur teams, sort of, I, I guess including the academy teams, w- will adopt the same uh, similar style, or or is it? I suppose the other view is that um, academy teams play a variety of styles. I'm really interested in your in your thoughts on that because it's one I wrestle with quite a bit. Well, the first part of the question, Gareth, I'll answer by saying that, you know, we have employed a uh, an academy coach or an NPL slash NYL coach, and that's Milos Dajowski. And and just to share that he's he's also an assistant coach of the first team. So the reason we bring Mila in is that we hope and we would expect that Mila pretty much executes a very similar philosophy um, to ours. And the reason why is because we will be drawing upon his squad of players throughout the course of our, our tenure at the football club, which could be hopefully many, many years. So so what I can say is the first academy coach we've appointed is he's intricately linked into our first team squad. He's there every day. He's with Kate. He's working on an understanding of the philosophy. Um, he's setting up exercises. He's driving exercises. So we're doing that. We're investing time in him so that he can pretty much mirror what we're doing um, in the first team in in the academy, what happens thereafter, Gareth? I'm, I ain't too sure, um, and I don't even know the time frame of that. You'd like to think that that might be something in 12, 24 months um, the club starts to look at. Um, and I suppose the second part of that question is, what do I philosophically believe is best at an academy? Well, that's maybe a, a topic for another another show, but. Um, my general thoughts are over my journey that um, having a playing style and a philosophy is and having it uniform across the club, I think is a very important aspect. I think where the confusion lies in in Australia and people saying, oh, what about all these different philosophies and so forth? I think people confuse playing a different formation across youth teams as, oh my God, that's a different philosophy. Well, no, I don't think it is. You can have, you can have lots of different learning modes and, and lots of exploring for young players across formations, tactics and so forth without actually compromising what you stand for as a football club or your values and beliefs or your philosophy. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... It, it gives. It, I think it's a really good point that you know we're not when we're talking of what we're talking about in terms of playing style and playing philosophy um, doesn't mean we're just talking about formations. Um, and I think that's that's a really good point. Uh, thanks for making that, Ivan. Thank you. I think I got. I, I th- I'm not. You know, I'm not good at uh, this sort of grilling of uh, panelists, but I think I got some stuff out of you there. That's that's great. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ivan. Um, Kate. 
Okay. Um, as head um, of analysis, I, I guess you spend quite a bit of your time analysing best practice across the world and, and certainly in, in the A-League. And I wonder if you um, have any insight into um, sort of any current trends um, in the world or, or in the A-League or in Australia specifically around playing styles and, and what teams are doing? Yeah, so I think both globally and within Australia, the the trends, the tactical trends kind of go in waves and there's a bit of an evolution to it. So I think if you look globally, we look towards that possession-based evolution that happened when Pep Guardiola and Barcelona came about and teams then tried to take elements of that playing style incorporated into their own and, and there was a much stronger focus on keeping the ball and dominating and that then led into the next evolution which was an emphasis on a high press playing style you think of then Klopp and Dortmund Klopp then comes to Liverpool and now it's about you know being compact pressing high winning the ball back in transition and counter-attacking really quickly and I think there's probably been a similar arc um, within the A-League where you think towards Brisbane Roar and Ange Postacoglu where that possession-based style came in. Of course, they earned the nickname Raw Salona. Um, and then following on from that, a lot of Australian teams then tried to adopt that possession-based style, which led to the success of the Wanderers and the Mariners under Popovich and Arnold, where their focus was on effective high-pressing football. So I think those evolutions have been quite similar, both globally and within Australia, but ultimately the main overarching themes of, of tactical evolution is that more often teams are looking to dominate and control games, whether that's with or without the ball or in all phases of the game. And also they have to, to play quicker with quicker speed of action, quicker decision-making with less time and space. So we've even seen that within Australia changing, um, with our post COVID end to the season where it was in cooler weather. And they did some research at the FFA with Doug Kors where they found that speed of action, speed of execution and the physical demands of the game, even just shifting from one half of the season to then post COVID increased. So I think those trends are definitely evident globally and in Australia. And, and yeah, I suppose to summarize it, it's about more teams more often trying to dominate the game and, because everyone's trying to play high tempo football, then it's quicker decisions and less time and space on the ball to then impose your style of football. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. One of the things that I'm hoping the, um, the audience ask or, or maybe Jan covers in, in the summary is, uh, is, is what all this means for um, the coaches at, at different age groups and different levels. And, and I'll, I'll be really interested in, 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 um, in, in that perspective later on. So I'm, I'm sowing that seed for, for Jan or, or the, the coaches watching to, to ask those sorts of questions. That's brilliant, Kate. Thank you. Um, Ivan, back, back to you. And it, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, recruitment. And I, I, I think you might still be in the recruitment phase um, and, and, and putting a squad together, um, which is, I, I guess, the, the uniqueness of, of the context where normally you might, a new coach comes in, they might be trying to develop a, a potentially a different playing style or philosophy with an existing group of players. So I'm really interested in, in, in the recruitment at the moment. And um, A, what, you know, what sort of players are you looking for in terms of their attributes and their, their character and their, their, um, their you know, their, their, their skills, etc. And I, after that, I, and it may not be as simple as this, but does signing players affect the playing style or is there a definite need to, to recruit players that can fit in to your, your playing style? It's a good question, Gareth. Um, so I suppose the, the luxury of actually having a blank canvas when you do enter a football club is you can actually recruit players who you know have the attributes which will bring your playing style and your philosophy to life. So from that point of view, it's been a godsend. The challenge, though, is recruiting 20 to 22 players, which, ain't, which, isn't, which isn't easy. Um, that's been further, uh, how could I say, made, made difficult by COVID and trying to fill visa spots and so forth. So 
So yes, it's, it was a luxury and it was something that was very exciting. Um, but with the inception of COVID and the challenges around border control and so forth, it's been extremely, extremely challenging and, uh, and difficult and, and, and lots of hard work. Um, in terms of the players you try and recruit, absolutely, you know, it, it, it's multifaceted, but you need to tick off numerous boxes. And that is that, you know, if you want to be a possession-based team and build up through the lines, well, you need to find defenders and centre-backs who are comfortable on the ball. You need to find a goalkeeper who's really comfortable on the ball and will play out. Um, so so you, you really need to be very sure that you are getting the right footballer. And then there's the other aspect. We don't have a culture at our football club, right? So you can have all the best tactics, you can have all the best staff, you can have all the best equipment, but if you don't have a team culture and a good working environment, and we've all and we've all worked in environments not only in football but outside outside of football where you you see it's seemingly all perfect, but bad people, bad characters can really impact your ability to to drive the business or your football club forward. So. Not only are we trying to get 20 to 25 good footballers who are tactically proficient, who actually can bring our playing style to life, we need to make sure that we also have good people because you get one shot at it, Gareth. And in particular, when you don't have a culture, um, we think it's incredibly important to have, have those people. Um, so we're very comfortable with how the recruitment um, has gone today. Um, we're really excited by the group that we've got. Um, we're not fully complete, but hopefully that'll be finalised in the coming coming weeks. And uh, and let's see where it, uh, where it lands. It's um, it's always nice to have a plan on paper, and then I suppose you and your audience will get to see just after Christmas how it all eventuates. A bit exciting. And and you talk about the culture, uh, Ivan. Um, have you you know is that will that be driven by the coaches? Do you think or or you know, the club will probably maybe want to represent its, its local community. Um, is, is that culture sort of starting to emer emerge? Is there a, a sort of picture of that? Absolutely. And, and, and a lot of it's born out of, you know, having open dialogue with our, with our directors and ownership group. And they put clear parameters around the type of people and, and what we would like to try to build as a football club. So that's, that's the first thing. You need to have that dialogue and make sure that, you know, that there's some context around what they're trying to achieve. As a, as a football club. Um, and we definitely do want to have um, locals and the local community um, within our squad and that, and that connection with the community. And, and that's been exciting and we think that's important, um, you know, and then, you know, we needed experience and people say, oh, you know, there's some players that are old. There's, yeah, but people don't understand why we bring in these players. So Mark Milligan, for example, not only does he bring in someone who can bring our playing style to life, but he can actually do a hell of a lot more when you're building a football club. He, he, he controls the dressing room. This, per, this person, not the player, the person's been to four world clubs, four world cups. He's been played across the world, across different cultures, and he's still playing and extremely successful. That's the type of character we want to have at our football club. That's the type of person we want our young players to have as a as a mentor in the in the change room so um it's been really exciting and we think we've got the balance right always going to be challenges but uh hopefully lands but we're tracking along quite well we think brilliant thanks ivan and i just saw i just saw uh cat put in the the chat function to remind coaches to to ask some questions i'm going to ask uh kate one more question then i'm going to ask Jan to do a uh a brief summary so far, and then we'll, we'll throw over to, to questions um, from the coaches. So, so definitely make sure that you get your questions um, in there and, 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 and Kat will select um, the, the, the most interesting ones to, to, to ask. Okay, Kate, um, I guess part of your job is, and correct me if I'm wrong, will be uh, assessing the how the, how the playing style, st style is going and collecting key data um, to help you do that as, you know, as a way of validating or, or recognising areas for improvement. So I'd love to know if you've got a, a vision of, of what that will look like. Um, I think I've been pretty fortunate to have worked with Ivan and Ante previously in our roles with the Matildas. So that 
as an analyst has given me this really strong position where I understand what the playing style is and what we want to achieve as a team. And I suppose one of the key parts of being an analyst is you're there to support the coaching staff, support the players. And to do that best, you need to understand what the objectives are and the way the team looks to play. So, yeah, I mean, a key function of my role is to, um, I suppose, track and evaluate whether we were effective in implementing our playing style, both, you know, over the course of a season or over a block within a season, but then also from game to game. And then also digging even deeper, trying to evaluate and assess whether we've been effective at coaching our playing style in a meeting room or on the pitch as well. So that is a key part of of what the analyst does. But I think most importantly, it's understanding what the playing style is and what the coaching staff and the players need as support to then bring that to life. So maybe uh, thinking back to um, the Matildas, what were some of those key data or, or things that you were, were collecting that was um, maybe thrown under the microscope the most? Um, so because we've got a, a, a philosophy where we want to dominate and control the game with the ball, then what we're doing with possession is really important for us. Um, so, for example, things like the possession statistics or pass counts, those quite generic things that we would get um, you know, you might see it on the TV post-match on the on the Fox Sports stats. Um, we try to make it more specific to what our playing style is. So we don't want to just have lots of passes or lots of possession. We want to be effective with that possession. And Ivan mentioned it earlier where we want to play through the lines. So as an example, one of the things that we'd look um, when we're evaluating after the match or even during the match is are we able to eliminate the first line of the opposition's press? And if we are, are we then able to get between lines or in behind their back four or back five? So, you know, with the ball, we're then looking at how effective are we at executing our playing style? And then with the reverse, we want to press high and win it back as quickly as possible. So when we don't have the ball, are we able to press effectively, win the ball back high? Um or as high as possible throughout the match. So rather than just looking at those generic um, statistics that sort of get thrown around maybe on television or, or, or quite broadly, we try to make what we look at and the key performance indicators really specific to our overall playing style, but then also what that specific game plan was for that match. That's great. And I, I, I like your point about um, it being used to evaluate the effectiveness of, of, of of the training of the coaching as well that's a, that's a, that's a really nice point and and for our coaches out here who um may like that sort of information or or you know think it's valuable but you know might just see it as something that can only be done at the top level have have you got it's a difficult question but have you got any advice on 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 how we might be able to capture some 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 key data to to see whether we're we're, we're do, you know meeting our, our our own playing styles and philosophies yeah, well, I suppose there's there's many different facets to analysis and one of them is data and statistics, but um, a lot of the time analysis can simply just be reviewing video. Um, and, you know, again, Ivan mentioned it, we have a clearly defined playing style. So if we then look back at the video and we have a clearly defined playing style and a clearly defined game plan, we should then be able to evaluate just by looking at the video whether we were able to achieve what we wanted to achieve. And then within that, you can analyze it. Did Were we unable to be effective because the opposition did something that we didn't expect, which again comes back up to us then reviewing our, our opposition analysis processes? Um, or, you know, were we unable to be effective because we didn't execute the particular pattern of play or, or whatever we were looking to do? So... Um, and, you know, it goes both ways as well. Were we effective because of our processes and our playing style? Um, so you, data and statistics is one aspect. And I suppose we're fortunate in a professional sporting environment where we have the technology, the time and, and the resources to do that. But within a, a, a club or, or a youth environment, the analysis culture is more so around 
reviewing video and also trying to engage with players to ensure that what you want them to do, they clearly understand. Brilliant. Thanks, Kate. Look, I'm going to, um, I'll give Ivan and, and Kate a, a small rest and I'm going to hand over to Jan in, in, in a minute. Um, but again, just, just a call to um, just reflect on, on, on those answers so far and on Jan's summary and, and any questions that you that you have put in the chat. Otherwise, Kat will steal it and ask her own questions. I'm sure she's got, she's got a few she'd, she'd like to ask as well. But I'm going to hand over to, to you, Jan, and just, uh, you know, a summary on what you've heard so far and, and maybe a comparison with your experiences at FC Utrecht or, or Arsenal and Wolfsburg would, would be really, really interesting. All right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for sharing all those uh, insights because it's always... Um, yeah, good to hear uh, how uh, the special situation at the club works. Um, and then you can see that every situation is different. So thank you for that. Um, I think special um, um, about this situation is that they almost started from a blank sheet. That doesn't happen a lot. Yeah? So most of the time uh, there is already a legacy, but these people are almost building a, lesson, uh, uh, a legacy, want to leave a legacy. And the interesting point, I think, and I really believe in that, that um, your playing style and philosophy is almost uh, representing uh, the culture. So um, everything what you do, you see back in the acting of people. And I think um, they made uh, a great step about, uh, I, I, I heard uh, Ivan say, good people. Um, and he also said that those people uh, could have uh, mentorship and, and could be role models. And I think that is a very important point in uh, a club like this, but in any club that, uh, that you're working at is that everybody uh, lives the values of uh, the culture, uh, what, what you see back in your playing style and philosophy. And uh, your playing style, often we, we only talk about the way you see the team play on the pitch, but let's say 90% of the time <laughs> you're not uh, seeing the games, but that is happening behind the, uh, the scenes eh? Be, uh, behind the game what you see on television and there is where the philosophy is so important what I um, and, and, and uh, you can find people, you can recruit people for that, so let's say uh, coaches and players um, but you can also attract people uh, and, and uh, to attract people like fans and, and people who want to play for you, want to work for you, uh, that, uh, that always comes back to uh, the culture, to, to, to um, let's say, uh, what your playing style and philosophy is. Um, I think Kate does a real uh, great job uh, with tracking and, and, and in, in what way um, the playing style and philosophy was effective. Um, and there she said already, that's not only on the pitch, that's also in the meeting rooms. Um, and, and one of the things I, I really love is that when you play through the lines and you bring that off the pitch, so in the meeting room, that means that everybody has to help each other, has to connect to each other, because otherwise on the pitch, you can't play through the lines because you have to see those little gaps. Somebody has to run in there. Uh, but not everybody, because then uh, you, you're always three players in the same uh, situation. So, and that is what I love about this conversation, that, that Ivan and Kate are so aligned. And the alignment also was uh, explained with the board. So it is not only the alignment between the people who set the standards, but it's also alignment with, okay, what do the owners want with this club? What, what do they want to achieve? What kind of goals they have? And what I heard a little bit, and I'm still interested in, in maybe uh, more about that, is that they wanted to see something back from, from the area that they uh, work. Uh, so they want to see players who maybe uh, uh, grew up there, uh, had their academy, and then go into the first team. 
And then you have, again, that alignment with the board, but also that attracts people to be fan of you. So that it, it's, it's, uh, we just started uh, for my feeling, but I think there was already uh, a lot in it. And this is a little bit summary of, uh, of uh, yeah. And when, when you announced, okay, if you, if you work at Arsenal, you can understand there is already a legacy. Eh? You can't uh, just uh, say from a blank sheet. Eh? There are expectations. There is a, a club philosophy. Wolfsburg the same, as Utrecht the same. And that is for coaches who work uh, go from club to club or be be uh, academy manager at one club and three or five years later at another club. That culture is so important. And I'm really interested in the views of Ivan and Kate on that, how they switched from the old job to the new job. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what, Ivan, shall we, we'll, uh, before Kat asks the question from the, uh, from the panel, you, you posed a question at the end. So uh, we'll, we'll throw it over to, to Ivan. Uh, Ivan, did you, did you want Jan to repeat that question or was that okay? Uh, if you could repeat it, that'd be great. Well, uh, the summary that, that I uh, made is that um, you started um, uh, with, with, with the whole group from a blank sheet, uh, but you also worked at clubs before where you maybe, that was okay. already a, a sort of a legacy, sort of a culture. And that for me, because I never experienced starting from a blank sheet. So I'm really interested what, what you took, took out of those experiences, not only you, but also your colleagues to, uh, to paint this picture now. It's a, it's a really good, good point, uh, Jan. And that is that when you go and, you, and, and I've only ever, uh, we've taken on roles where we've taken over from a previous coach. Um, and then all of a sudden it's, it hasn't been common in my journey where that previous coach had a similar playing style or philosophy to us. And that's the challenge. It's, it's a bit like international football because when you get, you get into international football or you take over from a previous coach, they've all got different playing styles and, and philosophies. International football, they come from 24 different clubs and all of them could be different. So, um, and that there is, is, what I think what coaching's about. Uh, how quickly and how effectively and efficiently can you transfer the vision that you have of your team into your players? Not mm. only do you need to um, be able to clearly show them and people like Kate um, in, in, um, in teams or working around Antra and I, video is huge. It's massive. Kate would be probably one of the most important uh, person that we have in educating and bringing our playing style to life, but you also need to convince players. So that then becomes your leadership um, piece. You know, I always say, what is coaching? Well, coaching is all about at senior and performance level, the art of influencing. I really need to not only show you what I want, but I need you to believe that this is the best for, for you and for your team and for the club and for all of us to win a, a game of football. And that, that just becomes a little bit more difficult when you, when you take over at a club. Half the team will buy in straight away because more often they're not young, they don't like the previous coach, so they're happy yeah. to see. You know? and, then, mm. and then the other half would be loyal to that person and that then becomes the art of influencing. Um, the other thing that we're, we're very, very strong on, and I would say that both Kate and I have uh, very similar strengths, like real strengths, is we drive process. We, we really have identified a process of bringing a playing style to life in our weekly workflow, and ultimately we drive process. And then it becomes uh, up to Ante, the leader, to, to, to bring it all to life and so forth. So... I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's very difficult. Um, this has been difficult on another level. You're not influencing as, as many people. It's just you, you, you're recruiting more people. You're educating more people. So it's just become um, a bit more difficult that way. But equally as difficult, but on different, in different areas. No, thank you, Ivan. Thank you for this uh, explanation, uh, Ivan. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Good summary. Thank you. Kat, have we got any uh, questions you particularly like from uh, uh, the, the audience? And, and you can decide whether you ask it on their behalf or we 
we, we asked them to, to come off video and mute and ask it themselves. Sure, thanks, Nick. Some great questions coming through. I'm going to invite Stuart Many um, has a question uh, for Kate. So, if Stuart, you want to just unmute yourself and you can ask Kate your question. Hey, hey thank you. Sorry, I've got a little baby with me right now. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome, um, Stuart. Yeah, uh, hey, Kate, um, Ivan, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to learn a little bit more about the um, analysis process from Kate, kind of maybe even what a week might look like um, post-match and then through training and leading into the next match. Hey, Stuart. Thank you. Um, yeah, I suppose as a as a overview or a summary, the analysis process that we go through involves post-match review of the match we've just played, but also the opposition analysis and previewing of the next match. But then there's also the, the element of, of training and what we do during the week to bridge what we've just done in the previous match, improve upon that or um, uh, re-implement that, but then also the tweaks that we need for our upcoming opponents. So in terms of what a general week will look like. I mean, to, to be honest, this is an exciting element for me because this will be my first exposure on a week to week process of this. Whereas previously having been involved in, in national teams, your preparation is for a 12 or 14 day block where you might have two or three games in that block. And then you're, you're back away planning and preparing for the next international break. So um, in terms of a summary of, of what the analysis process is, we're preparing for our upcoming opponents. So we might look at, say, six to eight of their previous games. We're looking at lineup information, um, but also the opponent's playing style, their strengths and weaknesses with and without the ball, key individuals, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then we're trying to formulate a game plan that allows us to impose our playing style on the op opposition. Um, we don't want to change our playing style, but we might tweak or adjust individual tactics or tasks that we ask of our players. So we won't go from one game where we're pressing high to suddenly the next game where we're in a low block. But what we might see is that from one game to the next, the way we press or the way we defend is slightly different based on the opponent. Maybe they play with the back five and then the next week it's a back four. So the playing style doesn't change and our philosophical view on, on how we want to impose ourselves on the game doesn't change, but potentially game plan and tactical tweaks do, do come about. So then in that part of the process, we're trying to make as crystal clear as possible what that game plan is and what our objectives for that matches and then it's about the the training on the park and you know through our video meetings and then on the pitch as well how do we link those messages so that the players you know realistically on the pitch you've only got in the space of a week maybe you know three and a half four hours on pitch to prepare them for for their upcoming match how do you be as effective and efficient as possible so that the whole team understands what's being asked of them in that coming match. Um, and then once you do get to game day itself, we uh, film that game in wide angle, um, as well as we've got the broadcast footage. Uh, we code and analyze it live. And then we try to affect performance in the game with our different scenarios and planning that we've done. Also at halftime with halftime video. Um, and then post-match, it's reviewing, were those processes effective? Was the game plan effective? Um, and then preparing for the next week. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and Stuart, that was one of the questions for later. So um, I, I've just drawn a line through one of the questions I was going to ask Kate, Kate later. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, Kat, cool. any, any okay. others? Yeah, there was a question from uh, John, and I think Kate just answered it, talking about compromising your own playing style 
uh, to make sure you get the result. And as Kate mentioned there, there's obviously tweaks in terms of changing some of the, the, the principles or the approaches to, to your playing style there. But there was another question from Jamie, um, both the Ivan or Kate, talking about the environment. What kind of environment are you looking to create and perhaps where is that coming from in terms of perhaps the philosophy or the, the values and beliefs as a coaching group or the club as a whole? What kind of environment are you looking to create at the new club? I'm not sure if Kate's looking at me and I'm looking at her. but <laughs> um, Look, I, I think both of us can, can, uh, can answer that and I'll just give my version. That is that... Um, we drive, anyone who knows or has worked with, uh, with myself will know that we drive standards. You know, we, we want to be best practised. We aspire to be best practice. Um, so we always want our environment to be uh, something that resembles the highest standards a football has ever, ever been a part of. So that doesn't guarantee you wins on the board, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't aspire to be the best. And I think one of the clear things that, you know, maybe some of my values and beliefs are that you, you've got to work hard, you've got to try to be the best. Um, you, you're a footballer or you're an employee of the football club 24-7, so not only on match day or at training, but also off the pitch. Um, and I think we also want to have a very much an inclusive environment. One of the best things I think that's happened to me over my football journey is I've probably met some females. You know, they, they definitely give a different perspective, um, have definitely balanced out um, the way I manage people, manage players, um, behave in and around football clubs. So having Kate around, not only has she bought us or bought me a world of knowledge from a t technical and tactical and analytical point of view, but but having a female in the room has been absolutely fabulous. So I think our environment, um, again, looking to get females involved, looking to, to get maybe even special needs or Indigenous community people involved in our football club, but everyone drives standards. We're not there to drive rules. We drive standards. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks, Kat. And maybe keep an eye on those cats. We'll have some time to come back for, for some more questions later. Thank you. Yeah, so keep those keep those questions going, whether it's in response to those answers or or just something that you're you're particularly interested in with with, with Ivan, Kate, and and and, uh, and, and MacArthur. Um, Ivan, I'm not going to give you a rest. I'm I'm coming back to you. Um, so it, you've got your big picture of your playing style philosophy, and then ideally you're recruiting the people that can can bring that to life on on the coaching side and the the, the playing side. Um, then when we get into the detail of, of designing and planning sessions, um, which, which I, I, I assume are looking to reinforce and, and, and develop and progress the playing style, what's that look like on a, on a, on a daily basis for you? Yeah, and look, again, Kate and I are heavily involved. Obviously, the other um, component when, when designing training sessions and a real critical component through pre-season is the strength and conditioning and the physical outcomes that we would like to achieve so we'd any session that we plan involves myself um, primarily with uh, our s and c and then uh, we'll have kate in the background making sure that she can bring it to life and and that's her her expertise also uh, but the way we do it generally is given we've worked for uh, together for a while we actually know what the key key um how could I say, key factors of our playing style are. So we know what outcomes we want and we work back in our periodized cycle to ensure that each of those outcomes are achieved by, by ticking them off in this periodized plan. So, so ultimately we're working off a December, a late December start, and then I'll sit down with, you know, the SNC guy, Anthony Correa and Kate and Anto and say, these are the things that we need to cover off. Um, and then we just plug it in to our periodised plan based on the uh, the demands of certain sessions. So um, probably a bit difficult to explain. It's probably easier to show. But um, the other thing that we, we do know is we also have a, a, a decent idea of what the potential failure modes are of, our, of bringing this playing style to life because we've done it on a few occasions. And ultimately, we make sure that they're also ticked off in session design. Um, from session design, so once we've got 
outcomes that we want, we, we, we very much then start to break the session down into a BP or BPO type of day. Um, transition moments generally will be within those and built within those um, sessions. And then the art of the art of effective coaching and the best coaching or technical teams are maximising the learning opportunities in the 60 to 90 minutes you may have on that given day. So I'll, I'll say it's not only about ticking off, um, you know, these these aspects of our playing style, but how do you get more out of a positioning game or a passing practice or a pattern play if you've got two six-minute blocks? I think that's the biggest challenge for coaches. Don't just say, yep, we've got pattern play and, you know, we've got six minutes, we've covered it off. It's right here. How do I maximise my pattern play? And I think... Uh, you know, our technical team, uh, through experience, again, has become very clever. Um, and we, we really do, I think, Kate, use like restarts um, in, a, in, a, in a certain way that can not only tick off key outcomes in BP, but also give us some BPO outcomes. So you ma what you're trying to do is maximise the limited time you have as a coach, because as much as people think we have professional athletes Oh, they're there seven days a week. We actually have very little coaching time or learning time on pitch. And this is where Kate's function of off-pitch video becomes critical. But maximising that time on pitch is probably where we put more effort into design, Gary. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great uh, message that goes across whatever coaching context. Thanks, Ivan. Um, Kate, um, I, I was going to ask about the, the sort of relationship between um, opposition playing style and the impact on yours, but you answered that excellently in in in, um, in answer to Stuart's question. So I'm uh, I'm quite interested in um, I suppose two parts. One, how you work with individual players and and, and their part in the, the the playing style, and possibly your role in educating um, whether it's new players or existing players around the, the playing style. Whether there you know there needs to be common terminology. Or um, you know players who may not um, you, you think that they 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 could do what you're asking them to do, but maybe it's a lack of understanding. So lots of questions there. If you can remember any of them, uh, be great to have a, a, an answer. Yeah, well, I think the first thing that sort of piqued my interest from that question was the the terminology side, and I think having a, a common language and a common understanding of what a certain um, principle means on the pitch and how the players implement that, that's really important. Um, and again, because we are a startup club and we have that blank canvas where we can build it, you know, if you think about what we've discussed so far, we've been through that process where you're trying to identify and recruit the players who we think have the attributes can bring the, to, to bring that to life. And then when we actually get them into our training environment, you sort of almost want to go through an induction process where you're starting to introduce them, you know, to the most important broad concepts of, of, of our playing style um, and what they'll be asked to do. And I think that's position specific as well, because different players in different roles will have um, different terminology used more frequently. So that common language and, um, and, and common understanding of what's being asked of them is really important and that has to be specific to the individuals, what position they are, but also what type of player they are. So some might be further along in their football education or, or certainly in our case, someone like Mark Milligan that Ivan mentioned, he's worked with Ante Milicic for a long time previously. And actually a lot of players that we've been able to recruit to MacArthur have worked with um, Ante and Ivan previously through either senior or youth national team. So that in itself gives us a little bit of a, of a shortcut where they already are familiar with the coach and the type of language that's used, but still they have been away. They've been in a different club environment under different coaches. So when they do come back in and start working with us, it's about having that consistent terminology, consistent principles, consistent tasks that they're being asked to do so that they can then continually uh, bring that to life every single day. And, and I suppose just following on as well from the point that Ivan made around planning and preparing for sessions, both session to session, and then over a periodized plan, 
you're not going to improve something if you don't work on it. So that in itself, you know, once you start to learn about what individuals are like, what they need, then you start to learn their strengths and areas for improvement. So both individual video, unit meetings, on the pitch, off the pitch, it's about them, they're giving them the opportunity to practice and improve those areas of their game. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. You did brilliantly to remember uh, all aspects of that question. Thanks, Kate. Now, really interesting around the the individualised nature of it and the education um, piece, which, again, I think is transferable probably against all, across all our contexts. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Kat, um, any more questions come in that have uh, taken your interest? Yeah, so one here from John, it goes back to Ivan talking about setting the standards, not rules, um, and, and having that blank canvas. And, and as you mentioned, Kate, a lot of experienced players coming into the environment. Who, who's actually setting the standards? Is, is, do you envisage that something that's going to be collaborative across the whole club, or is that the role of the board or the coaching and the technical staff, or, or do you feel it's a leadership group within your players? I think it's fair to say that the the, the people that set the standards um, is very much our leadership group, and that leadership group's Anto, right? At the end of the day, he's the head coach. Um, in terms of him setting standards, I think it's more his values and beliefs, and we talk about philosophies and that, and, and Anto's a guy who has high standards. He then goes out and 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 engage a staff who have high standards because that's a value and belief that he's grown up with. It's it's who it's what um, resonates with him. It's 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 him itself. So so I don't think there's people out there who are given the task to set standards. You either believe in high standards or you don't. And it, like I said, it doesn't mean you uh, high standards get you wins on the board. It's who we are as people. Um, and ultimately Anta drives those standards and we find players who can who can lift and have similar values. Um, that being said, the club obviously has certain standards that they want to meet, and that's a collaborative approach, and that's that's been communicated through from the directors um, through to uh, through to answer and even the playing group. So there's some communication there. But ultimately, I think the people that drive the standards are, are Ante's value and belief system. Honestly, do because you're around him, and he's not running rules a rule book saying you're not doing that, you're not doing that. It's just through his work and through his processes that you see, Rodeo, we want to be up there. And uh, and ultimately, like I said, any trial or so even if parts of the audience would, would love to bring you in one day, the one thing you'll walk away and say, shit, they've got high standards. And that I think is a value and belief system of, of very much our, our technical team, which he's gone out and handpicked based on what, what he wants and what resonates with him. Great, thank you. Kat, another one? Yeah, excellent. I'm actually going to throw one in there and it's probably been a little bit of a trending topic around director of coaches or technical directors. So this might sort of filter into our NPL landscape. Um, but picking up just on those comments around whether or not your coaching has been effective what measures are you taking place or have in your coaching careers or within the role of the analyst to actually perhaps have a tangible measurement or a process process that actually indicates effectiveness and what are some of the, the solutions or, or ways to, to improve? No one's putting a hand up for that, Kat. <laughs> you're going to have to... Ivan, gonna... Ivan, could you perhaps answer that one for us? I thought Kate just put herself off Kate mute. Kate went off mute then, didn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how see. about... How Keep about Kate, Kate, you... Oh, look, um, measuring effectiveness, uh, I think Kate touched on it before, and that is that I think over my journey, my playing style and my value and beliefs, they've become clearer, Kat. Right, so so as they become clearer, I then probably know how to measure and validate and make good that analysis of is it is it actually working? Is it not working? 
the lowest common denominator, unfortunately for all of us, is is winning and losing games of football. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, I've been distracted by that in trying to bring and validate my playing style to life, which is always a challenge for coaches at, at any level. Um, so I think I've always been a data person and I've worked really closely with, with Kate to actually try and validate our playing style and, and looking at KPIs and measures that that can actually say, yes, you're going and you're tracking in the, in the right area or you're not. That being said, there's, and, and uh, you know, the audience might say, yeah, but we don't have data. I think your eyes are as good as, as good a measure as anything, but your eyes will only lie to you if you actually yourself don't know what you're looking for. And I can honestly say that through my journey. When I was confused on my coaching journey, it was because I had a very fuzzy value and belief system or very fuzzy playing style. But, you know, through experience and through watching more football, uh, through coaching more football, through different teams, I've worked out what really resonates and sits with me. And the clearer I've been with my playing style, the easier it's been to track how well I've been going. And I now do use and validate data, but a lot of the times I'll I'll say, I saw this, Kate, what do the numbers say? So first is I don't let numbers drive my decision. It's my eyes. Um, and then I'll say, I think this, Kate, what, what do the numbers say? And more often than not, it'll, it'll say, yep, that's exactly right. So I think, I think it's really my eyes. But having a clear, clear, vision and philosophy and playing style did take me a while on my coaching journey. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, right, coaches, I, I reckon we can... Um, um, Ivan and Kate, are you good for another 10 minutes? Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, coaches out there, if you if, if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, you, you come off um, and put your cameras on and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take some um, um, open questions from, from, from the floor. So um, if... Um, you'd like to uh, turn your videos on. We get to see your smiling faces, um, and then we can we can open up for for people that want to ask um, a, a few questions. And then we will definitely go back to Jan um, for another uh, summary because a lot has has happened. Um, a lot has been spoken since then. Well, we've only got John who's brave enough to come off the camera. I don't know what everyone else is doing. I don't want to ask, but. Uh, um here we go jamie always yeah good one jamie jamie's always on on camera um okay hey jake here we go we're getting some people right, thanks Stephen. okay right well i tell you what ja jamie um or whoever john you're off um you're off mute i assume you're going first with a question oh well you well you are we, we can't hear you though john Well, well, yeah, we'll come back to you. So, has anybody um, like to ask a question? Otherwise, I'm sure we can. We, we, we've got a few more we can ask. But it'd be nice if uh, if you guys are listening and you, you've got a question. Like Jamie, you ready? Yes. Um, morning, morning from the UK. Um, morning, as Jamie. always, it's not from Jamaica this time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my question was to both Ivan and and uh, Kate. Is yes. But my my question was, how does uh, your what would you look for in, in terms of a player? Is it more the technical side of things, or is it more the the personal profile of the per, um, of the person? So, what are you looking at, um, kind of bringing in as as your um, for your recruitment? And is it to drive the to drive the standards or drive the playing style? Is that is that to Ivan? Jamie, uh, to both. So okay. it was it was more of an analyst when you're when you're looking to recruit players. Okay, all right. That, actually, that's quite interesting. Analyst role in sort of scouting and recruitment. Kate, okay, I don't know if that's been been covered. Yeah, I suppose. Um, again, it comes back to my earlier point where the role of the analyst is is you know multifaceted. Um, it also now in in the club setting involves. And, and touches on a little bit around player recruitment. In terms of what my role is around supporting the coaches for recruiting of players, it's to try to find 
um, shortcuts wherever possible to uh, whittle down, um, I suppose, the, the candidate list because you can imagine with a startup club, coaches are getting sent so many names. They also have so many names that have been flagged through our own processes and through their own experiences of working with players. And then it's around having quite um, standardised bits of um, data and information that, you know, suggests to us, yes, this player can execute our playing style. Yes, this player is going to be fit and available to play the number of games required within the A-League. Um, and then once we've got that and we've filtered that down, then very much it comes down to watching video, seeing the player within their club environment, within different club environments, if they've played at different clubs, different countries, different leagues around the world, and then trying to evaluate as much as possible whether that player would be able to fit within our playing style. And that can be tricky because sometimes a player's at a different club and they're being asked to do a role that isn't what we would ask them to do if they were playing a similar role within our team or within our playing style. So then it's around looking at certain attributes of what that player can do, which we then know replicates in our playing style. Um, and, then, and then a lot of what the coaches go out and do through their contacts and through their years of experience is to try to find as many uh, personal reference points as possible around that player, and what that player's personality is like. And again, we, we've been quite fortunate where because Ante and Ivan have such a clearly defined playing style that then attracts players who have worked with them previously who then want to work with them again because they know that that playing style suits the way that they play and the way they want to play. So that helps the process a lot. Fantastic. Thank you. Ivan, Just anything to that, add? Yeah. The, the, uh, the other thing, Jamie, that's uh, really critical is we spend a lot of time after Kate's uh, funneled the, the list from that wide and she tries to narrow it in to make our workload um, reduce it as much as possible. We do a hell of a lot of reference checking. So if you speak to my wife, Jamie, I'm always on the phone. Right Now you know why. So we spend a lot of time doing character referencing and so forth. And again, that's, that's the other advantage, you know, we have as a technical group working across national teams. Um, and, and, you know, the S&C guys worked in the A-League internationally. Um, we've got Mile Stajowski, who's got a playing career that spans France, England. It's funny how this industry works. We can always link in to find someone who has worked or can give us a, a character reference on on most players that, that would come uh, a shortlist. And uh, we would never sign a player without um, doing those character reference checks um, and also uh, having at least one, if not two, direct Zoom chats or, or teleconferences with the player. Um, and in recent cases, you're probably spending a bit of time wanting to to connect with their partners also, in particular with visa players or foreigners. Interesting, fascinating. Thank you, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Jamie. John, how's your uh, is your microphone working now? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Ivan, yeah, Ivan, small head. Ivan, good hearing from you again. Uh, lovely. Uh, hey, I'm fascinated by the standards, right? So everybody, like all companies, and. I'm saying that we have high standards and so forth, and, and nobody's going to say we don't have high standards. Well, what, what are some examples where you would say, look, you, you have these standards, but you don't expect other clubs to do it, and that's where you're, there's a differentiator there? Um, look, I won't comment on other clubs or other national teams yeah, that we've yeah. been exposed to because, again, the standards that we drive are because they're, they're values that I hold. I drive standards in my own household. Uh, you know, that's just the way I raise my kids and the way my, my wife and I operate. Aunt is the same, Kate's the same. Uh, what I will say is in terms of driving standards is we're, we're always, and the, for the better word, Kate's agitated, Ivan's ag agitated, Anthony Career and Ante are agitated. And by, by that, what I mean is that we're constantly searching for something better, something that will give us or improve our existing processes. So we're never resting on our laurels and we're always challenging each other. So the thing that you probably see different in, 
in our technical team compared to, let's say, industry and so forth is our leader opens and provides every one of his employees with a voice. So everyone has a say. And once everyone has a say, that generates very robust discussion. Robust discussion in a lot of organisations, a lot of football clubs becomes very, very uncomfortable. We embrace it. And I think when you say we drive standards, it's, it's continually challenging each other. And when you challenge your processes, you're challenging a person. And ultimately that can get prickly. But we see that as it's not a personal thing. It's for the good of the team. It's for the good of us in the long run. Why? Because we want to win a game of football. So I think that's the best way for me to describe how we drive standards. And that is by one, answer provides everyone a voice. And two, we're continually challenging what each of us do and we're benchmarking against best practice. And Kate's got a, a really good network of, you know, what is happening at Manchester City? What is happening at Barcelona? What ha what's happening in men's football, women's football? And I think, I think that's the way we, uh, we, we drive standards, continually looking to take us into an uncomfortable state as opposed to being comfortable. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, John. Thanks for your question, John. Um, I'm going to take uh, one more question. I think, Phil, did you have uh, your hand up earlier and I might have missed it? Go for it, Phil. Yeah. Hey, Ivan. Um, just a question for you. With the, um, the discussions around sorting out the transfers, system in Australia, has that changed your recruitment policy as far as uh, looking to give young players more of an opportunity? Hey, Phil, for starters, how are you? Are you well? Good, mate. Good. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Now, thanks for the question. So I think what has happened is, uh, one, the current status of the A-League, and, and obviously it's been well, well documented that the salary cap's reduced. So by virtue of the salary cap reducing, I think that'll organically allow younger players to get more opportunity uh, in in the A-League. Um, and then the other thing is that COVID's hit and it's literally closed our borders. So um, engaging a foreigner to come to Australia in, a, in, a, in an economic environment, which is, let's say, poorer because of the salary cap and the challenges of getting a visa in this country now has uh, will ensure that you'll see an A-League, which probably resembles closer to the old NSL, a, a breeding ground for young players to develop, at least for, for the next season, if not the next couple. Excellent. Thank yeah, good. You. Thanks for your question, Phil. Look, I'm, I'm very conscious of, of Ivan and, and, and Kate's time, as, as well as everybody's time. And I think what I'd, I'd like to do is I'd like to give Jan a, a couple of minutes to sort of tie a bow around it and maybe just um, remind us of the, 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 the key takeaways from your perspective, Jan. Uh, yes. So um, I must say this, this was a very uh, intensive uh, webinar um, what I uh, want to summarize but the, so much uh, I could uh, that's why I don't do it Ivan <laughs> but I, I must say I think it's very honest to uh, say that the role of the head coach at a club um, is, is so important to understand that so in this situation uh, it's, it's Ante but we spoke about Pep we spoke about um, uh, club, uh, if you talk about uh, coaches in uh, Germany, Spain or, or Italy or France, it's always the head coach who is uh, so, so important and, and, and drives the values and, and, and drives the, the culture. I think a lot of people often are afraid of that to give um, that all in the hands of, of a head coach, but he is by far the most important person uh, at the club. Um, then what I uh, took out is uh, to maximize the 90 minutes training. So, uh, and there everything comes together. So um, the intensity, the data, the video, uh, the uh, measure effectiveness, uh, but also the potential uh, weak points. And that is what I liked about the, the, the constantly looking for improvements. 
Um, and uh, the point that Kate made of uh, seeing potential. So, so every day look at, okay, what's more? What, 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 what can we achieve better? Bigger chance for success is looking at potential for um, uh, new players that are coming in that maybe are very interesting for your club, um, but you have to find them. Um, and that all starts with a clear playing style. I think Ivan said it, <laughs> maximized it by it started from sort of fuzziness, but um, more and more the, the, the key PIs that he uh, worked out for, um, for his, um, his way of looking at the game and, 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 and what's all involved. Um, and, then, and then still, still at this moment, he asks every time, uh, Kate, I saw this, did I see it right? So that for me is the, yeah, an example of, of how this works at this moment um, um, at, at the club where they're working uh, together. Um, yeah, so, so um, and then you understand, uh, a lot of people ask, uh, what do you do all day? <laughs> what, uh, why is, is that a full-time job? Well, it's, uh, it's 80 plus hours when you work at a football club in this kind of positions. And then you still think you have not time enough to um, to do your role. So uh, I want to thank uh, Kate and Ivan for uh, for their sharing their insights. And it was it was uh, great. And I will follow uh, the club from uh, <laughs> from this moment on. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, that was an excellent summary. And yeah, hopefully you'll uh, you picked up some. Uh... Some new supporters and uh, fans as a, as, a, as a result of this. Look, um, we, 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 we'll call it a night there. Um, I said at the beginning at, um, that I thought it was going to be a fascinating, fascinating insight into this quite unique context, and f from my perspective, it, it definitely was. Um, and I imagine there's loads of loads of positives from having the blank piece of paper, and there's loads of challenges from having the blank piece of paper as well. And I'm sure that will continue. And you certainly have our, our best wishes, Ivan and and, uh, and Kate. But look, I'd like to f first thank um, the audience um, for for turning up. You know, for some of you, it's your Sunday morning. Some of you, it's your Sunday evening. Um, as I was supposed to be painting the front of my house today, and I, I left, my missus says, "How many more of these are you going to do?" Um, and I told her I, I, I've definitely committed to November and December, and then we'll see how we go. But as as long as people are still uh, there's still a desire for it, and people are turning up, then then uh, I won't tell her she won't watch this. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll keep going as as long as possible. Um, but I'd also really like to thank uh, Kat and Yan because. Um, um, they jumped in at the um, at the last minute. Um, Kat got signed up after she pointed out that I'd said that this was happening in August, um, which was a mistake. So um, I, I thanked her for pointing that out and said, can you help me? Um, and Jan, like I said, woke up, thought he was going to have a leisurely morning walking his dog and woke up to a message from me saying, uh, can you help today? So so Kat and Jan, thank you very much. Great to see you again and having you on the other side of the, the, the panel asking the questions rather than answering. Thank you. And um, and um, mostly, I'd, I'd really like to thank, uh, of course, Ivan and and Kate for your, your time and your expertise. And I work at the Australian College of Physical Education, and we, we've just started a new partnership with with MacArthur FA, and they've been really generous providing um, opportunities for our students on our on our sports degrees. Um, but this was again a great opportunity of your, um, sorry, a great example of your openness and willingness to share. So hopefully the partnership between ACPE and uh, MacArthur um, Football Club will go from strength to strength. So Ivan and Kate, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tank.